Okay. Um, let me show you. Let me show you your um. Let me show you um the thing that you done. So this is by Carlos Herbal. Um, can you tell me, Carlos, what uh how did you find it difficult to actually do the blade? Carlos, are you here? Hi. <clears throat> Can you tell me how what uh how did you find the plate? Was it difficult? Hello. Sir, I don't put mic na mami. Ah, okay. Sorry, hindi ko nakita. Um. So this is by Carlos. I could see you uh you found it trouble to do the transparency and opacity plate. And then this is by Pyrone, which is really, really good. So um, the only problem with this is that it's not entirely with the same style like, uh, like what I told you, but you rendered it very well. And then this is by Joseph. So I could see you are struggling with the blending, but I, that is okay because this is the first time you, is this the first time you, um, you made, uh, you use acrylic? Not really, pero hindi din po kasi talaga ako, um, like expert with portraits kasi more on landscape po ako. Okay. So, I am. And then, you know, I'm going to submit. And this is by Ariel. I can see now. Um, Ariel, would you mind telling me uh, which part? of it did you uh, find it hard and how did you um, uh, so you get a couple of things why did i are you okay Arnold? hi ma'am sorry kakagising lang sorry po Are you, are you oh. Okay? oh, hi, ma'am. Sorry. Sorry about that. Yung akin po, yung nahihirapan po lang ako sa, ano, sa lips po. Medyo hindi pantay. 
saka yung yung ano po yung ko yung ano ko po yung kamay ko po kasi kasi pare-parehas lang po yung kulay sa background and uh, the skin of the of my portrait no? kasi i just made it look like transparent so. well, did you colored everything or did you parang fill in the gaps or fill in as you color I've colored almost everything ma'am ma kasi ginagaya na inspired po ako sa isang ano po is isa isang reference na ganun din po the the background and the portrait mismo ay magkasi kulay po Ma'am, medyo choppy po kayo. Choppy ako? Medyo lang po, ma'am. Okay. Um, so what you can have done with this, um, can you turn off your mic first? Baka yung mga problem. Alright. Am I okay now? I think? Yes po. Okay. So <laughs> yun yung po. Um, this is my feedback, so that that was the problem. Um, if I may give you a suggestion, what you could have done is color the whole background and then superimpose the figure. Paranaman, there is a sense of gradation, and then you cannot see uh, the brush when where you stop, uh, where you stop the brushes or you know, that would have been easier. And I guess you have to um, practice more with your blending. And I could also see that parang you use transparent paint. So um, what you could have done is parang uh, make different kinds of layers para um, the gradient would be much smoother if that is what you wanted to do. And um, I would also, because the black here is nga, not very opaque, just to bring out the portrait, um, maybe it would be better for the uh, black here or the outline to be more opaque. So what you could have done is um, put more black and build it up with layers. So that is the aim or the goal of this first thing, thing plate. And that is um, for you to have um, a little practice on how to use acrylic or how to use building up layers or how to use um, transparent paint to your advantage, all right? But for the first time, this is really good. And I like the idea. Okay, po, ma'am. Julian? Hmm, okay. So this is a little bit different. Matagal yung gloss. So can you explain me, can you explain to me uh, how did you come up with this design or how did, um, why did you try to um, put it here? What is the meaning of this source on the hair, for example? And why did you use uh, a color that is very similar to the hair? Julian, can you explain? And also, can you please turn on your cameras? Okay. 
Julian, are you able to speak up? Ah, hindi gumagana yung mic mo. So, okay, type. Type it. I search for a Google image of the girl and then. And then what did you do? Why, why is the. Okay, you tried to do your version of it, but why is the. What is the meaning of the words triumph, content, support, and composure? Why those particular words and why is it in the hair and why not on the face? So, oh, so not in the hair, actually, but in the head, more of. So you put these words, or these words are um, a positive things to you, to, um, to push you. All right. Okay, I understand. So, um... Okay, so um, we can work on this, I guess. So a figure drawing, you're also in my figure drawing class, right? We can um, work on the hair. Yeah, I will teach you how to do the hair. And then, um, and just having a difficult time why you color the same color with the hair or it's a little bit similar to <laughs> it's a little bit similar to the color of the hair i mean why is it gray julian Okay. All right. All right. Let's move on. I tapos na pala. You're the last one. So. All right. So let me check on. Oops, let me go back. So I can see that you, most of you um, also did your, your um, research paper, actually only four of you. Can you tell me who can speak? Who can tell me how did you find the research paper? Ariel, is it too hard? So that is actually what we're going to discuss today. Yes, Irene. Ma'am, pwede po bang magpasa mamaya? Ihahabol. All right. Hello? Yes, yes, I can. Hello? Oh. Yes, Irene, you can. Tsaka mga can... support, nagpasa po ako. Oh, si um, ikaw yung nauna kong... 
um, diniscuss. Would you like to discuss with us kung bakit ganun yung portrait mo? Ah, okay. Medyo nagahang. So, um, so, um, just to, just to, um, uh, go back. The assignment for the research paper is to um, write an essay with a minimum of how many? 600 words. And, th th and the 600 words does not include date, name, class description, they wrote it, and the essay title. Um, so the essay should um, discuss how is Kola related to form. Sorry. Will an object have a form when it does not have color? Does light color and dark color affect the form of an object? And does warm color and cool colors affect the form of the object? Can anyone tell me what they learned? Guys? Ariel? Cesar? Mom? Yes. Tell me what you learned to the research. No. Sorry, ma'am. Sorry, ma'am. Okay, si Julian muna. Okay, so... Wala pa lang mic si Julian. <laughs> All right. Um, how about Brian, Joseph? Yes, ma'am. Um, so for me po, nakakatulong yung color with form kasi um, um, isa po sa mga reasons is yung um, helpful yung color in terms of um, it could help showcase the um, light and the shadows of an object. So, if done correctly po, yung um, with the help of color, maki, um, parang ma-project yung kung paano lumalabas yung object organically. So, for example, may isang object sa table, tapos um, din rowing and nirender siya ng tama. And like, um, parang accurate yung colors na ginamit. Um, ayun nga po, may kita yung magiging highlights and shadow. So, with art po, siguro makakatulong siya na mas magmukhang three-dimensional yung object instead of just it looking flat. Naka-mic, ah, naka-mute po yung mic niya ma'am. That is actually quite good because uh, without light, we cannot actually see the color, right? But same goes with um, the color. Uh, there is no color without light or there is no light without color, right? Tamaba. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So that is the relation of color to form. So... Yeah, madali nang siya actually. So, um, let's proceed to discussion. So, I, I prepared a PowerPoint for you guys. So, um, this is um, an in-depth 
Wait lang, ay kasi ko lang yung screen ko. Just, um, I just my screen to prepare for the slide show. Let's see, I'm going to read. Oops. Yeah. So can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Paul. Okay. So color in relation. Sorry, this is for So, um, I cannot really put it in slideshow because it will, um, because I won't be able to see you if I put it on the slideshow. So I can only do this. So I hope you don't mind. So, um, just like what, um, Joseph. Ryan discussed. Um, there is an actual connection with, between color and light, and that white light is also when you uh, make it go through a prism, it would actually show different kinds of colors, right? And the color of each object is depends on how much light or what kind of light or wavelength it absorbs so that it absorbs so that and that how it comprises light or the color so every color in this room for example where i am or where you are um, has a different kind of absorption to light and that is how you use your color, or that is how color came to be. Um, but it is different with people who are actually colorblind, because most of them, like not really most of them, 1% of them experience monochromatic color blindness um, while um, they only distinguish between blue or yellow and sometimes some of them can only see the pastels do you know the pastels like um they can see very muted colors sometimes they cannot distinguish what is red from green and stuff like that and i even know someone who actually painted a christmas tree orange because he did, he did not know um, that he picked the wrong color because he was colorblind. Um, but um, humans, most of the time, me and you and most of the people of this earth are trichomats, meaning we have receptors for red, green, blue, yellow, and light, dark, with um, People who are colorblind, they have 
um, maybe damage or um, are they lack receptors or if they have fault receptors that uh, they could only distinguish um, little colors. While there are also a, a small percentage of people that are tetrachromats, they are the people who respond to ultraviolet light and infra infrared light, but it is very difficult to find these people and it is also very difficult to um, see what kind of or to distinguish what kind of colors or how they see the world so just to break things down you know that light and color is very um very they have a relation deep relation to each other but um the eye itself is like a unique mechanism natural mechanism that allows you to distinguish which color is which or what light or how bright the light is or how dark the light is so the eye itself is divided into two receptors you have the rod and the coats Young rod, um, they detect the lightness and darkness of color. They are colorblind. They do not detect color, and they actually function at lower light levels. Um, this rod helps you to see at night. This is what functions when um, when there is night, when it is night, or when there are little light. So this is the rod in your eyes. And the cones, these are receptors respond to color and tone. Uh, when you come across different kinds of blue, for example, that is the cones doing, all right? And this is usually um, used during uh, light time or daytime. So, and so color of form uh so you now understand how different percept how different our perception can be right and how light um can be different or how everyone's eyes could see um differently than most other people and that is also because uh, sometimes our rods and codes are a little bit different some can see some can be colorblind some can not when some also can um, perceive different kinds of light while others could be um, not so sensitive to it so I am but um, for visual arts, um, painting is an illusion of form. So as you can see here by a portrait of Mark Matisse by Andre Durain. So if you can see here, um, lighter pigments are added and darker pigments are the main color of the object and somehow it is used to render naturalistic effects of light and shade. But the disadvantage for this portrait is that there is too much in intensity to the original color, that um, the highlights, the shadows, they are being blended and it was sacrificed. So this kind of style is also and post-impressionist style, and is usually used by Paul Cézanne, George Seurat, and symbolically by Gauquin and Van Gogh. And also um, another form that, another style that uses 
color as a form are the FAVs or those who are interested or those who particularly employ FAVism. FAVism is a style of painting developed at the start of the 20th century by Henry Matisse and André Durain. So, uh, FAVs, they value the intense color and they use the color to uh, put emotional impact more rather to render the form. But if you could see here also, um, you could also see the form even if they only, even if the rain only use color. So, I, so another kind of how color or light is, um, is actually connected is that the moonlight is not actually blue, but rather it's actually reddish. Um, it is only blue because our visual system plays tricks on us when we look things at a very dim light. So if you could see here, so the rods are most, mostly active during the time. So if you can see the red here becomes a little bit violet, the greenish thing become gray, and the orange become another part of gray, and the fuchsia or so small, or the purple here become a little bit pink, and the green become white, for example. So, I don't know. So, and that this uh, phenomenon is um, called Perkin gene shift. So, Perkin G, I think, I'm not sure how to um, pronounce it, but we call it Perkin gene shift. And this would be helpful further when you paint or do illustrations and for, and that it is important for you to take note of this. So the bar rods are um, active usually at night, but these rods are also more sensitive to greenish wavelength. So that's why the blue here become a little bit green and the green become whiter and and the red here become almost black because it is more sensitive to black, I mean, to green. So that's why the blue green hues appear more lighter than those, uh, th than those um, colors that lacks um, the green pigment. And the same thing, and it is the sa uh, same explanation why we see the moonlight blue. Let's say our rods are not um, fully equipped to see, uh, are not that sensitive to red, to red um, wavelengths, and, and that they're more sensitive to green. So that's why also red roses looks like black in the moonlight. So that's why you see it like this. All right. So the appearance of colors is influenced by simultaneous contrast, successive contrast, chromatic ab uh, adaptation, and color constancy and the size of objects. So when you say simultaneous contrast, it refers to the hue, saturation, brightness of the background, and background color. And then when you say successive contrast, it is when you are looking at one color and it changes to the next colors we see. And this actually, um, 
affect the form of the object. And then color adaptation is when illumination changes in the color temperature. And in a way, it changes the proportion of the object. And sometimes it looks like balance, sometimes um, the color of the light levels change or the shading of the uh, object change. And then you also, and also you have color constancy, wherein the chromat chromatic adaptation or eyes adapt to um, experience of known objects and that the colors, because of this experience, uh, the colors appear to me consistent regardless of lighting. Because um, this is what happens when we see things normally, this is normal, and we just let it go as normal. We uh, fail to see how light can change the color of the object or how a pink object with a shadow can have grayish tones to it or blackish tones. So that is what you call color constancy. And the size of the object becomes also less distinct to the color. So the small spots of the color uh, will lose uh, their color when you view them from the distance. All right. So can you, someone, can someone tell me what they see in this um, four squares? Anyone? Yes, Ariel. Um, and you only see all of them now that are light and some of them are blur like the lighting, the square, and some of them are brighter colors. Okay. What else? Uh, how can you differentiate the one and the uh, one and the four? Fourth picture. One, four, three, two. I miss. I miss. I mix them now. Sorry. So, um, what can you um, see more? I, what kind of differences did you see? The contrast? No, it has the same contrast. Um, Brian, only Brian has Mike Tamaba. And see Paul. Ako po ba yung mag answer or? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, in difference differences po no. So for me po, um. So for me yung yung way kung paano po na de-depict yung blurriness nung, for example, dun sa third compared to the first or like the others. Um, yung strokes po nung brush for the edges, um, parang iniiba po so that yung magiging, yun nga po, yung magiging effect niya is magiging blurry yung itsura compared dun sa black boxes dun sa likod na very crisp yung pagka-paint. Important. And how does that affect how you perceive the picture? Or oh, so, yeah, so um, yung edges po and yung depth, ayun nga, uh, nakakatulong po siya maging contrast or like yung um, doon nagpo-focus yung mata natin sa parang crisp yung edges. So parang Nag, yung for example yung mga blurry na boxes um nagmumukhang mas malayo compared dun sa um crisp lines ng ibang boxes po. Okay, that's partly right. So, let me explain um 
to explain more. So, number one, this one, um, you could see na parang it's just on top of each other, or it's just there, it's flat. Well, number two here, it the 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 straight lines, the white lines are a little bit blurry, while the gray cube is or the gray rectangle is a little bit crisp. So what the illusion that comes with it is that um the the gray rectangle looks like it's floating or on top of the black squares, right? And number three, um, the rectangle here, the gray rectangle here is um, blurry. And the fact of it is that um, the black squares or the black rectangles looks like it is on top and the, and the gray and the gray rectangle looks like it's in the bottom. So you're right. And then, um, well, the difference here on uh, number four is that the rectangle is um, crisp, and half of the um, half of this is actually um, half of the white lines are blurry, so it looks like. It is on top, the rectangle on top, and then it submerged for a little bit, and uh, so it would like the black rectangle is in a, is in a cone or in a curve curve um, structure. So that is the illusion of um, how you use your transparency and opacity so or how you use um, the edges or this trick to um, suggest depth to your objects or your portrait or landscapes so I am So you do understand what our complements are, right? So complements are those colors and in the opposite of the color wheel. So if you have blue, you have orange here. So our blue, yellow, and magenta challenges green, for example. So it is also the same with um, this of the, when you use color. So, because the darkness is um, the absence of light rather than its rival counterpart. So the reaction of this one, the cool colors and the warm colors, they are also somehow connected to each other on how you see how you see it on a painting so blue or the, the cool colors could be a substitute for uh the black or the lightened color of black and yellow can also be uh, a substitute for the darkening color of the white do you um understand what I'm trying to say? Yes, but, okay. yes, ma'am. Okay. So, um, this is um, color constancy. Color constancy uh, refers to the automatic habit of interpreting local colors as stable and changing regardless of effects of colored illumination. So um, if you could see it here, how red and the green filter are put, but somehow the colors would also remain the same. It would look the same, no matter how much filter is put, 
there are if you look at it um if you look at it um wait long let me zoom in in if you look at it closely the red here the pinkish is not really red or the pink is not really that pink or the red here became green right and the green here or the teal color become became actually light green so that is um the so this is how you put your work engine shift right so that is something that you need to master so um example this is in real life you could also see stars for example when you see stars it looks like yellow for example even if um stars could be like a bowling hot fire what big ball of fire and that it could also have different kinds of colors right and I mean, the color, the gases that it's burning might be different and it will have different kinds of colors. Here, when you see it from the sky, it would look like yellow. And that also explains how some of the stars looks like twinkling blue or red and something like that. And this also, the perk engine shift is also, um, this also affects how we see um, objects under the orange sky, for example, or orange light. For example, let me uh, play with my ring light. So you can see my face, right? Uh, if I change it to yellow, oops. If I change this to yellow, my face looks yellowish and my lips looks like brown. And I look brown as well. But I put it on white, I look brown and pale while the my lips looks um a little bit red. So I am. If I put it, oh, that was a um, mid pala. So a mixture of white and yellow. And if I if I do the white thing, it would look like I am very, very glossy and I have dark tones and also white tones. So that is the difference with the light. And another example is how um, how you see the blinking light of the ambulance. Sometimes it looks like red and blue, right? But you could still see it from the far. It looks still red and blue. But it actually changes. And it also, um, it also blinks, right? So it turns off and turns on. Right, and the and the uh, you the red on the ambulance, the red and blue there of the light of the ambulance is actually just the color for or uh, the color of the light. No, not the light itself, but yung cover. So underneath the cover is a yellow blinking light. But we still see it as red and blue, despite of um the light or the color do you understand what i trying to say guys yes Hello? okay yes Majo? did you say Majo? So, um, basta, nag-change siya with different kinds of colors or different kinds.
kind of light. Yung color constancy, uh, we actually see it by experience. So um, we get used to the color seeing, for example, the ambulance, the color of the ambulance. We, we are used to seeing it as um, red and blue, the light. Pero inside of it is actually a yellow blinking light. So let me get an example. So for example, this is your light. You have white, deba, right? And then I put it... Um, Pero I put, um, for example, yellow light on it. Pero because you see white, it would look like white. But in truth is that it, what I use is a yellow light where you could still see white because the, the bottle is white. Do you understand? It's how your um, mind play tricks on you because we are used to um, this kind of, um, we are subjected to what we know of and um, what we know, we almost instantly um, put it or put that stereotype on other people or on these objects, for example. Do you get what I'm trying to say? So far, yes. <laughs> okay, I'll move on. Uh -huh. If you don't understand, just ask or raise your hand. So um, adaptation and contrast. One color affects the way we perceive other colors. This happens both two-dimensionally as flat colors and it also influences each other in the 3D realm as well. So if you can see here, this is all white, but um, the longer that you look at it, it looks like um, this has a depth to it, like it's a cone na parang pa inside siya. Do you get it? Or pa taas pala, pa taas. And also the blue, it looks like pababasha. So the effect of the white color is that it, or the light color is that the objects looks much more near than the blue tone. So that's why if you use something, if you paint a landscape or something, you would see how these objects look more near and when you put um, sky tone or blue tone these objects would look much more farther than it really is so that is how you use your colors to um, perform and this is also the local color so if you could see here let me zoom in, in for you. So um, this is also um, the illusion of what you see and how color um, changes the form. So if you can see here, this is red, right? Tama? Very if you look closely to it, you could see different kinds of red. And because of the dark colors and the light color, you could see that it actually has form, right? It looks like yes, this. Um. So it looks like this is um, under, and then there is light to it, and it looks like bulging because. May um, pata arrange husha. Yeah. So it is reddish, orange, or whatever you see it. So 
that is how your color affects the form of the object. Same thing with here. You have, you can see when you ask someone, immediately, this is yellow, this is yellow. But as, as artists, we have to be um, very specific with the colors and you have to see it very clearly that um, the yellow here is not just one color yellow, but a different kinds of colors of yellow. For example, here there are orange, right? Or a little bit of ochre. This is orange or a little bit of brown. And if you could see here, um, the red here could also affect how you see the object. For example, the light here can bleed into this color. So that is why this has orange tone when you see it. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Do you get, do you understand? Guys? Yes, all right. Let me just drink. Ma ano na yung voice vocal cords ko. So it is also um, the same with here. You can see how the color leads to this grayish metal thingy. What do you call this? A knob. <laughs> so the metal knob here. Of and also the some parts of the stand bleeds from the red color of the um, body of the thing. So that is how your light will reflect to certain kinds of objects and how these objects would um, affect to or affect the other kinds of objects, especially with a metal because the metal is very reflective and other things as well and for example this part this is because it's against the sun right you can see it it's against the sun but this part here it reflects the yellow light of the sun so that is why it's yellow and some part of white. So, and and in turn, it also affects how you perceive its form. You can see here there is no actual outline. It's more of the using of colors in different hues and shades that. Uh, gives form to uh, this artwork. So, color context. What can you tell me about um, this shapes here? Guys? Anyone? Paul? Yung color na, yung orange po, pag iba yung intensity niya based dun sa background. Dun sa black na background, lumalabas yung ano niya, yung intensity niya, yung pagka-full ng hue. And then dun sa white, same din halos, pero mas ano yung sa black. Dun sa orange na background, pansinin kasi same sila nung color. Mm -hmm. Then dun sa last yung complementary color niya. Mas brilliant siya dun sa complementary color. Okay, very good. You actually read it. <laughs> so, let me irritate that. 
So if you could see here, um, just like what I explained earlier, how the color would bleed, but, but at the same time, how you put colors um, side by side by each other would actually um, affect how you perceive that color. So if you could see um, with black and white, it actually looks like um, it is more brilliant, but um, if you can pair black and white, must uh, the the square here, the red reddish square, is um, duller than the black. So the intensity of the red square is more brilliant to the black background compared to the white background. And then with orange, since like Paul said, it's complementary to each, it's analogous to each other that um that it looks a little bit duller or lifeless in that area and and if you compare it to the teal color the blue green color it is a complementary color to um the square so that it looks like a little bit brilliant than compared to with the orange background. And if you also see here, if you compare black and the teal background, you can see how black actually, it, with a black background, you can see how the square it looks a little li larger than this color, the teal color. So that is also how you use your colors in relation to form or how um, color would affect your form. How about this one? Can anyone tell me what they see? Or how does that affect how you see? Um, you can tell me. Anyone? Yes, Tyrone. Tyrone. It affects ma'am how we see. Kasi same lang naman yung color between yung nasa gitna nila. Ang nag, nagkakaroon lang ho ng effect kasi yung different ano ho nung background nila. Hello? Okay. Hello? Uh, I just drank. Oh, no. Hello. You left. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, it is true that um, the color inside the squares are the same, but it looks different when when you look at it side by side hello tyrone are you okay can you hear me so yes ma'am nag <laughs> nawawala yung signal ko sorry <laughs> okay can you continue explaining or should i continue or have you finished? Okay, I will continue. So, if you look at here, it looks a little bit duller, and you can it, and the square here, or I mean the rectangle here, looks a little bit bluer. Yes, ma'am. Right. Right. So, uh, when you compare it to this one, it has the same color, but when you look at it, this color looks a little bit, no, oh, this looks like a little bit reddish, and while this looks like a little bit bluer. So, if you could see here, you have the same color, but different readings. Let me my phone 
So if you could um, analyze it, when you analyze it, um, the remember how your color bleeds to another color. So this is almost the same, but with a simpler object. So I am now. So um, another function of colors is that it could also use to express and it could also affect how uh, people would perceive your painting and that it is also used with trauma therapy. So, sorry. This is how um, people in painting actually became more relaxed when they're painting because the colors that they associated with will um, actually use that color to um, put their feelings inside canvas or in a work of art and that would um, let go of those feelings and instantly the person will get better. So these are examples of um, artists using their colors. So um, this is from a little bit of history. So good. Uh, lifetime of knowledge from master, a scholar through their arts, uh, their intense, intense, passions, unavoidable obsessions, and their staunch beliefs. So this is, this is the work by Helen Frankenthaler. So she was somehow the first who likes to innovate using color. Most of the time, her paintings are expressionist. And it is most of the time spontaneous. So um, this is not her. This is a painting of a woman. And look how she used uh, paint in um, doing the background. So she used to place strips of color near the edges of her painting and that this involves, and this became part of the painting itself. And then in 1970s, um, she started using thicker paint that allowed her to use bright colors. That is also reminiscent of Falvison. So if you could see how her paints are expressive in spite of the model here. So my picture is not that clear, but she actually painted this model in contrast to the different background. And you have also Claude Monet. Monet. <laughs> Claude Monet or Monet. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. So for well, Claude. Claude Monet. Well, Monet. Okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> I got surprised. <laughs> so, um, for him, color, is, he said, color is my day long obsession, joy, and torment. And usually, what he does is that he used to uh, paint the same thing with different kinds of color. Uh, for example, this this is a painting by of Rowan Cathedral, and it was captured in a under the facade of different lighting conditions. If you could see here, if he only used blue and some yellow and some orange colors, but you could still see the facade of the cathedral. It is also his um, it is also his statement how light 
can be used to uh, affect the different colors of the subject. So I and for Claude Claude Monet, he used to continuously rework the paintings in his studio, and he also used to explore different kinds of examples of colors and moods. So that is um, Claudette Monet. <laughs> so another saying by Claudette Monet is that when you go out to paint, try to forget what objects you have before you, a tree, a house, a field, or whatever. Merely think, here is a little square of blue. Here, an oblong of pink. Here, a strike of yellow. And paint it just as it looks to you, the exact color and shape. So for him, he doesn't believe on uh, using outlines. He merely color, use color to paint um, how he perceives the object. Um, it doesn't matter what the object is before him, but rather um, you paint it how you see it. And this is also uh, an example of his work using analogous colors. So, there you go. Wait lang guys ha. Okay, I'm back. Um, so with Claude Monet, um, he used analogous colors to portray a sense of calm. And this is an example of his water lilies. If you can see it here, he only used a little, some brush strokes. And, but you could also see how he used different colors to portray the water, uh, analogous colors to portray the water, different kinds of blue, different kinds of green and yellow and how the lilies are actually portrayed with a little white, yellow, and a little pink. So that is how um, little color can influence um, the form of the object and also how you can use these colors to um, portray different kinds of details. So, are you? So, if you can also see the complementary colors, yellow and blue, they are they make things pop. I mean, they bring out uh, the colors green and yellow. They make things more brilliant when you put them side by side with each other. And you also have this famous painter, Vincent van Gogh. Um, a little advice from van Gogh. Um, he said, the painter of the future will be a colorist, the like of which has never yet been seen. But I am sure I am right to think that it will come in a later generation, and it is up to us to do all we can to encourage it without question or complaint. So according to him, um, you have to color what um, is not yet been seen. So um, that's why when you see his paintings, you can see how blue 
for example, this one, blue has little dots of yellow and orange, right? So remember what I explained to you later that I earlier today, that um, the small dots of color will not affect the uh, big color or the majority of the colors. So I uh, so Vincent van Gogh actually used this to create texture and also a style or an effect to his painting. And also with Vincent van Gogh, he believed that there is no blue without yellow and without orange. This is his relationship to colors and painting. Um, so um, what is um, good, sorry, what is good about Vince, sorry, I have to drink water. <laughs> What is good about Vincent van Gogh is that he, what he tries, he doesn't try to paint what he sees. Rather, he paints the color that is used to express himself. So what he sees is not necessarily um, what is real, but rather it is what he feels. And then he goes on to say that to express the love of two lovers by the marriage of two complementary colors, like to express the thought of the brow by radiance of light tone against a dark background, to express hope by some star, someone's passion by radiance of the setting sun. So that is how, what, that is what his relationship to colors. It is merely to express his love of colors, how to express um, his, um, his inspiration of light to colors, or how light is um, amazing against a dark background. And to express hope to express hope. And, and then you have another painter, Georgia Keefe, or Georgia O'Keefe. So if you could see in her painting, this is an example of analogous and complementary colors um, having a harmony with each other. So it is a very simple palette, and um, but there are opposite colors like green and red. Um, it gives out a, a powerful contrast to each other, but somehow it looks like it is. Um, it has this harmony, and that also goes with how she blended uh, the paints well and that he, notice how she also used the black and white this one so it gives out this unique intensity and counterbalance with each other so if you could see how the white is on top or and then the black here uh, gives out the sense of depth to the lower bottom of the um, of the painting. So again, oops. So just to explain more. Um, the use of cool cool colors like blue, blue greens, blue violets. Um, they are actually associated with body of water that recedes into the distance. It is also the same with the sky and other and other objects that um, indicate 
um, distance or depth to um, an object or the painting. That is also why, because of this illusion, um, because of how we portray it in our mind or how we perceive it in our mind, we use cool colors to associate with black or shadows. And that sometimes we also use uh, cool colors um, to imitate black or to substitute the use of black. And same thing with um, warm colors like yellow. Um, we also uh, use this to associate light or light or some or for objects to look like they're uh, closer to the picture plane. Because the sun or the warmness of the um, warm colors make it, uh, our eyes perceive it as very warm, as very, um, it is near and it is sunny and so this makes um, our our mind look like this is the first thing our mind would see or our eyes would see and therefore it is very helpful to uh, use it when you're painting objects that are closer closer to the foreground or the picture plane. So you have the valves. So remember what I told you about valvism. So uh, the valves or valvism uh, is the heightened sense of color to express a strong emotional response to nature. So valvism is like uh, is from the period of post-impressionism, but um, it but the difference is that it only lasted for three years because it wasn't that very popular, but uh, they use the method of pointillism and pointillism and very, um, very strong or brilliant use of colors to express their um, emotional responses to nature. So this is an example of a painting by Henry Matisse. It's called Les Tos de Color. It is oil on canvas and it's on the Hermitage at St. Petersburg, Russia. So if you can see here um, how there are different kinds of opacity and transparency with the use of colors. And he also used um, complementary colors uh, like orange and green and blue to express um, depth and and then he used yellow for light and violet or dark green or blue green to express the intensity of the grass, the colors, and other things. Another example of painting by Henry Matisse, this is the desert. Uh, the Desert Harmony in Red. It was made in 1908 by Henry Matisse. For Henry Matisse, he believes that the chief function of color should be serve, should be to serve expression. Color helps to express light, not the physical phenomenon, but the only light that really exists that in artist's brain. So for Henry Matisse, light is um, something that you only uh, perceive in your brain. So that when he means light here, this is the 
lightness or the dullness of colors. And the tone of the color is actually what our mind or our eyes perceive. And remember your roads and cones? I think so, he's a Dutch painter. And um, that is how um, Henry Matisse sees, or how Henry Matisse statement is when it comes to color. It helps to express light, even if the light is just a phenomenon in our mind. So, I am. And also, he also said that before he doesn't really know what color to put down. So when he doesn't know what color to put down, he used black. And then he realized that black is a force. Whatever you put on a canvas or in a paper, when you put black first, it would immediately eat up that color. So if, for example, if you put black first and then you, on top you put yellow, um, the yellow won't be as brilliant as without the black. Why? Because black eats up the color. It's like, it's like a black hole, or that's why black hole is uh, called black hole, because it eats up the color, it eats up the light. So um, before Henry Matisse only used black as a form or to simplify the construction of the composition, but um when he realized this when he realized this he um he given up on blacks and that is what happened here so this is his painting see henry matisse so if you compare it to this this is black and how the black would like dominate and it is like uh, something that catches the eye first particularly this one and this one and when he realized this he give given up that and it is the same thing how um, traditional fine arts masters would tell you not to use black or limit the use of black because black eats up the color or it eats up the pigment and that it it is not a very good uh, medium to reflect light on and you have this Vasily Kedinsky so um, for Wassily Kandinsky, the sound of colors is so definite that it would be hard to find anyone who would express brilliant yellow with bass notes or dark like the trouble. So Wassily Kandinsky is also a Dutch painter, wherein a Dutch painter, a pianist, and a violinist, if I'm not mistaken. He uh, is a painter, musician, and he used his paints to also visualize the notes or the melody or the tune of what is ever going inside his head. So, um, and he also expressed how um, the colors is also like that. Uh, like bright yellow would be like the bass notes and the dark gray would be the treble. So bass notes, you know, parang the melody itself and the dark gray would be the treble, you know, parang how do it's, you know, parang um, second hand. If you know how to play the piano, that's, that's how you um, say it. So for him, color is like the keyboard. 
um, the eyes also have harmonies, which is mm -hmm. also correct because we also have harmony. We could also see harmony visually. And uh, the soul is the piano with many strings. And the artist is the hand that plays the piano, touching one key or another to cause vibrations in the soul. And the same principle also goes to his painting. So it's like uh, he's putting the music inside of him to a canvas or to a piano. So, I, so this uh, painting pala is called Blue Mountain and it is um, in Guggenheim Museum in New York. So according to Vasily Kandinsky, yes, it is a good painting. Um, for Vasily Kandinsky, he says that color hides a power, still unknown but real, which acts on every part of the human body. And this is true because um, painting as a use of therapy has been with us for how many centuries already? Even since the caveman started to use blood or some kind of pigment to paint the caves. But until now, we are not equally sure why painting is therapeutic, for example, why it calms the body, why it calms the mind, why it um, actually affects a person whenever they see it. So um, for us visual artists, it is um, an expression, it is a, a form of language, and it's also the same for Vasily Kandinsky. But that part of being a language is not thoroughly um, explained. It is not thoroughly um, studied. Because we take it as it is, it speaks to us when, okay, we buy it or something like that. So that is um, the effect of painting and the color and the art. And if you also see it here, he uses dotted colors, dotted black pigments, but um, the colors itself, um, gives out an abstraction, a little bit of abstraction, but you could also see different kinds of figures if you actually look more into it. So this is another, one of the last painters here that I'm going to um, discuss with you is a painting by J.M.W. Turner. So, um, Turner is a British, a British um, painter. So he was from a Romantic period, and he is um, known for his printing, his watercolor, and his expressive use of um, color to portray sublime sunlit sunscape seascapes so his critics um actually call him or call his painting afflicted when jaundice when you say jaundice it is uh the abnormal yellowing of the skin the eyes and i think the nails as well that is um jaundice and it is primarily um, if I'm not mistaken, it is primarily um, caused by the liver or somewhat of the bile and it, in excess of creatinine. I'm not sure, <laughs> but you know, um, jaundice is a physical disease wherein um, there is where the there is. Um, a yellowing of the skin, the eyes, and the nails and stuff. 
that um, for the critics of Turner, they call his painting afflicted with jaundice because most of these paintings are yellow or um, that and that he is uh, primarily um, famous for his painting, his use of seascapes with a um, brilliant yellow to it. So back then he used um, the experimental watercolor Indian yellow. Um, it's not very experimental today because Indian yellow is very um, common today. But before Indian yellow was um, a fluorescent paint um, derived from the urine of mango fed cows. So these cows are fed by mangoes and the urine would like um, be like this very, very bright yellow. And that is how the Indian yellow color came to be before. And then he would also use the synthetic chrome yellow where it is a lead based pigment. Uh, and then because of this pigment, it is lead. The lead can, is also poisonous to the body and it is known to use delirium. I mean, too much lead can have a different effects of the body and there is actually called lead poisoning because of the lead of the paint. So that is why um, it is very important for you to actually paint outside open air or with ventilation, proper ventilation. And sometimes I even paint with a mask on because I cannot handle that much fumes, even if it's um, odorless sometimes. It still has fumes, but um, anyway, with Turner, he used this kind of colors and that's how his colors would pop out um, and then the yellows would be very, very brilliant. And um, he also very like, he also liked his colors very much, the yellow tone. And if you can see, most of his paintings are yellow in hue and uh, that there is an excessive amount of detail through the waters and stuff. And for Jan Turner, it is um, how he expressed his uh, feelings through the yellow colors. And then you also have Giotto. Giotto is an, I think, architect or sculptor. So he did, or he designed the interior of the Scrovegni Chapel Padua in Northern Italy. So back then, during his time, they believed that gold is, um, gold symbolizes heaven. It symbolizes the magnificence, the, the overwhelming, the all uh, awesome, what do you call it? Um, um, the all the power, overwhelming power of God. They think gold is gold symbolizes that. But when Giotto came in, he doesn't believe that gold symbolizes um, God or the heavens and all. He believed instead that um, the color blue represented heaven and, and the external existence of God. So um, what he did was that he painted the, the, the ceiling of the Giotto Chapel blue. So from that belief, he made people see that it's not gold, but rather it's blue. So from then on, uh, royalty became blue. The, the eternal existence of God symbolizes blue from then on. So he was the first to um, make that statement and then show it and inspired a lot of people. So 
that was Yoto and how he did it. And then also how what how Luke and um can um, show form is or an emotion is this example by Pablo Picasso. So um, when I say form, um, if you guessed it right, form here could be literal or um, or subjective or abstract. And um, when you say form, it could be uh, the literal form, na, um, the form of the shape and stuff, or the physical form. And when you say form, it could also be the form of emotional impact of the painting, the form of how the, the compositions are placed. And you know, an example, a shape is not always three-dimensional or real, but it could also be 2D, for example. A uh, form is, like I said, could be taken literally or um, or could be subjective. So um, let me continue. So this painting by Pablo Picasso, the old guitarist, is is a painting oil on panel. And this is this was made during 1901 to 1904. So this he had actually a sort of depression. And from this year's three gap period, he has um, depression and Carl Jung actually um, described his depression as schizophrenia. And um, he was depressed because there was, he had a friend named Carlos Casagamas, Casagamas, and he was actually involved in a tragic suicide. And it, it made, um, Pablo Picasso very sad and his grief uh, led him to painting series of blue paintings and like I said the blue painting here is not actually literally blue in form but also um, also an abstract in form or um, what do you call this I forgot the term so the blue here is um, also implied, you know, implied. The blue here is also implied, meaning um, the it also evokes or expresses the emotional state of the artist, which is grief through because of the loss of his friend. So I. Uh, and then lastly, you have color field painting. And um, this was um, popularized by um, Rococo, Frank Teller, and other artists. So this is during the Fauvism period. And that um, color field painting is a style characterized primarily by using large fields of flat, solid color spread across or strained into the canvas. This movement of color became a subject itself. So with color field painting, the form of color is, or the form here, uh, the color does not actually give form, but rather it is the, the subject itself. So um, the color field painting, um, the subject here or the uh, the intention of this painting is to evoke different kinds of meaning 
depending on the viewer. So um, the art here is how the viewer would uh, feel different kinds of emotion while staring to the painting. So this is called emotional renaissance, wherein you resonate with a particular subject just by seeing it. So that is the color field painting. So again, the form of the color here is implied and not really the literal um, form. So here are your references. I, you can see here the examples, Masters and Artists of Relationship by healingpowerofart.com. And I also use the book, the textbook of James Gurney, Color and Light, a guide for realist painters. So do you have any questions? Um. Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. So I'm now going to. You sure you don't have any questions? Let me put our schedule. So the next, I will give you an exercise. Oh, I'm about. No, I already gave you an exercise, Bala. So I will give you an exercise. Today is 15, tama ba? 15, 22. Yes, so on 22, you're going to, um, we're going to have a lecture again on Memesis, opaque and translucent object. Um, so, uh, um, some of you haven't finished um, sending me the exercise, the research paper. So I'm giving you additional um, minutes to finish it. To those who are already finished, thank you for submitting. And um, you'll have very good points from me. And then what else? I am. So yun lang, um, that's what I'm going to give you. So I'm going to um I'm going to dismiss you early. Are you sure you have no questions? Guys, none. Okay, so um, class dismiss. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you, ma'am. Use the yes, Tyrone. Do you have a question for me, Tyrone? Totally. Okay. Hello. Yes. 